This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and welcome to Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We're a show that broadcasts live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30 from the Pioneer Plaza in beautiful downtown Honolulu, Hawaii. We focus on success stories in Hawaii of the businesses and the individuals that own and run those businesses, uh, trying to counterbalance some of the negativity that we've seen uh, out there over the years on how bad things are here in Hawaii. There are success stories, there are people that make things work. And we have them come on the show and explain what they've done and how they've done it and how they've gotten around some of these challenges. Uh, today we've got a, 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 an organization that's been around for a while and it kind of went away and now it's back. Uh, and we've got a, a person that has been very involved in the community for, for quite some time. Um, he's the president of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra uh, and his name is Michael Teeterton. And he's here to share some of his secrets on how he's making these things work. Michael, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you, Rich. Nice to be here. Um, now, you've been in Hawaii for quite some time, haven't you? Mm, 18 years or so. Yeah. 19, that, maybe. That's a while. And you came over here originally to fix something? I came in originally uh, to work with Hawaii Public Radio, which, uh, along with an awful lot of other not-for-profits, had, had a bumpy, bumpy ride during the 90s. Right. And... Uh, um, I, I thought it was going to be just for, a, you know, six months or so and uh, apply a few band-aids and it turned into 18 years. That and sounds like, but you enjoyed it while you were I there. loved it. I've not regretted a moment of it. It's, uh, it's been great. Now, and, and what have you done previous to that, that that kind of got you ready to come in and get your teeth into the Hawaii Public Radio? Uh, well, immediately before, I was bouncing around the country uh, fixing broken stations. Uh, the, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting uh, mm -hmm. uh, gave grants to stations that had run into some sort of difficulty or another, and um, I was one of the folks that they sent out to, to do that sort of work. But um, before that, I'd been building stations, which I, I used to enjoy building things, frankly. I don't care much for running them, but uh, <laughs> I, I love to build them. And uh, before that, I'd, I'd been a reporter, I'd been a producer, been involved in fundraising, done a little bit of engineering. And uh, and before that, I was a tool and die maker. So uh, wow, well, that's a, <laughs> a switch. Uh, a little bit. Of, it was, seemed like a reasonable evolution at the time. There was a lot of other things in between, you know. But uh, um, but yeah, that was my first trade. I was a tool and die maker, working, incidentally, for um, the BBC, which was wow. the Barking Brassware Corporation or company. So. Is that what the name was? That's what the name of my company was. Okay. Yeah. It was sort of a harbinger of things. But there's become. another BBC too. I've right? heard of them. I've heard of them. They do good work. They're coming along nicely. Yeah. <laughs> All right, very good. Uh, it was a broadcasting connection I was trying to make there, but uh, but you've got you know you're. It sounds like you're a turnaround specialist for the the radio station. Well, that's sort of what I became. Yeah, I never planned it that way, but uh, um, I just sort of I just gravitate toward um, problematic situations. I think. Well, it's the challenge. It is the challenge. Was, uh, I'd love to build things. It's uh, and whether you're building or rebuilding, it's the same same set of glands. I think. Very good. And so you've gone through and you had all that experience, and then they reached out to you and asked if you could help, or how did that all work out? Um, it was kind of curious, actually. I uh, I was in North Carolina, um, in Wilmington, North Carolina. I'd built the station there. I'd built the station. I helped build the station in uh, in Asheville, North Carolina, and uh, I'd been working out of there for years. And uh, I got to the point where I. Thought I thought, well, public radio has been a really good way to spend time, but I'm about done now. I've done everything I care to do with it. And, you know, I was involved with this going around fixing broken stations thing. And um, I had my house on the market, and I wound up, I was winding up my businesses, and uh, I was getting set to go back to London, which is where I come from originally, and uh, go back and reinvent myself again, you know. And uh, I was all set to do that, and had everything except a plane ticket, really. and, and um, 
suddenly, one week, I got three calls uh, in the space of seven days, all of them telling me about this situation in Honolulu. Mm. And uh, sure enough, um, there was a situation, and they were looking for someone to come out and, uh, um, well, they were looking for someone to head up the, the organization. They were in between managers, and uh, so I gave a call. I really didn't have that, in, in all honesty, I had not much interest in, uh, in coming out to Hawaii. It was the only state I'd never been to. Um, <laughs> But I'd seen it on television, and frankly, it wasn't all that appealing. It uh, it looked like you know there were lots of uh, sun, sand, and coconut well, I was just vacation say, compared places. Compared to London, there's a lot more sunshine out here. But there's a lot more theater in London. <laughs> there you go. Um, you know, yeah, it, it yeah. balances out. Um, but I really, anyway, it sounded like an intriguing thing to do before going back to Europe, and uh, and I came out, interviewed with the folks, and uh, just it was so unlike anything I'd expected it to be. In, in what sense? Was the unexpectedness the environment or the public radio situation? Oh, uh, the environment. Uh, specifically, Honolulu, which uh, I just had no real preconception other than what I'd seen on Hawaii Five O of what Honolulu looked like. And of course, that was dreadfully misleading. And what I found was this incredibly um, intense environment. Uh, I mean, I heard it was it was very cosmopolitan. People from all over the world lived here, and uh, that was that was intriguing. But I'd also heard it was a melting pot, and it was all very kumbaya. And uh, and what I found was exactly the opposite. It was a train wreck, and <laughs> in the nicest possible way. But all these cultures coming together and managing to coexist, and not only coexist, but um, Managing to to be dynamic and uh, for all that there are real challenges, obviously, to doing business in Hawaii, as you know better than anyone. Um, it uh, I don't know. It, it was thoroughly unique. It was like nothing I nothing I'd experienced before. It, it, just the the fact that there's so much Asian culture here and that uh, embedded into most Asian cultures is a uh, reluctance, for example, to say no. Uh, and yet, each Asian culture has a different way of not saying no. <laughs> and, and so when you're in a meeting with six or seven people around the table, all of them from different places, um, you, the, the business of body language gets to be awfully important. It's an and, interesting uh, dynamic that goes on. Oh, isn't it though? And, and coming from North Carolina, which has a similar sensibility, nobody likes to say no in the South either. And there are all sorts of ingenious ways of, uh, of not letting you know that's what's happening. Uh, you have to sort of figure it out. It's very polite. And there's also an oral culture, which it is here. Uh, and they're very proud of it, quite rightly. But anyway, it was uh, it was not what I expected. And there was a vibrant cultural community, which frankly I hadn't expected. And um, it was wonderfully exotic. And uh, that six months turned into 18 years. And uh, and a couple of radio networks, which um, yeah, I was kind of, kind of pleased with. And what when when you got here and you, you saw what was going on, you say, well, this this place maybe not so bad. I mm -hmm. can get used to it. Mm -hmm. um, you you had the challenge of trying to work with the public radio and, and address those issues. What were some of those issues at the time? Well, it was uh, as I mentioned earlier. We're talking about a period coming out of the '90s, a bumpy time uh, in Honolulu, in Hawaii, and uh, the radio station had uh, it had had a glorious start. You know, when, when entities like this are born, you know, there's a lot of enthusiasm, and then mm -hmm. there's a tendency for people to take Novelty it for granted. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Honeymoon is over. Um, and there were a couple of uh, a couple of moves that turned out to be not too timely, mm -hmm. uh, like the creation of a of a magazine uh, that turned out to be a very expensive and non-revenue producing sideline. So. The, the, that was, uh, been, it, it, it had gone into a sort of a decline uh, financially, and that has its effect throughout, you know, equipment. And, and it uh, can snowball on you, exactly, with the oh, and the staff and mm -hmm. other issues. And, and so morale was, was, was down quite a bit and all that. So there was the issue of morale, staff morale. There was the issue of... Um, 
of the bottom line of making payroll, you know, always a challenge. Uh, but most of all, there was the relationship between the radio station and the broader community mm. um, because of this slight but inexor seemingly inexorable decline. Um, there was not a failure of faith, but there was uh, a bit of a, um, a shrug of the shoulders and, oh, well, that seemed like a good idea at the time, but it's not going to work. And uh, convincing folks that this actually was a very successful enterprise, it's just that uh, it needed a little bit of tweaking. Mm -hmm. um, that was the big challenge, yeah. You know, and that must have been a particular challenge for you because, you know, dealing with staff morale and de mm. dealing with the community, as you mentioned, there's a lot of cultures and a lot of different ways of people, you know, watching and interacting. Mm -hmm. um, that must have taken a little bit of time for you to figure out or was it pretty straightforward? Um, oh, it took some time to figure out. Um, now, I'd had the advantage of doing this sort of thing around the country, just on two or three week consultancies, but you know, essentially parachuting into a situation and realizing over a period of time that uh, with all these challenged radio stations, um, Almost invariably, uh, the problems, whatever they were, engineering problems or, or uh, morale problems or financial problems or programming issues or whatever, tended to come back to the same, the same source, roughly speaking, which was a breakdown of communication mm -hmm. between the governing board and, uh, and the management of the station. Mm -hmm. but not, not invariably, but almost invariably. You could trace it back to that. So well, there's that constant, that, that mm -hmm. common theme, I guess, mm -hmm. that was kind of plaguing a lot of different organizations. Yeah, and you can't take that for granted, but uh, once you identify that sort of pattern, then uh, uh, it makes it a lot easier to troubleshoot. And uh, that had been the case here um, to, a, to an extent. The board was one of the reasons, that was another piece of magic, was just meeting with the board, the governing board, who uh, to a person were just absolutely splendid. The agents of change, all of them, and uh, all with a tremendous affection for Hawaii obviously, and uh, for doing positive work within the community. And they saw public radio as being not just a good thing in and of itself, but uh, catalytic, possibly, uh, for the whole enterprise. And they, they, had, they had that vision. They absolutely did. You know, I, I've been involved in a lot of different nonprofit organizations over the years at the board level. Uh, and you really need to have that engagement by the board. That mm -hmm. buy-in has to be there. If they're not passionate and they're not buying in, uh, that makes the job really, really hard. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, you know, the same can be said of, uh, of management. I mean, management has to. And that's the nice thing about working with not-for-profits is uh, generally uh, folks who have been around not-for-profits not long enough to make it into management um, are doing it because they love it. They love mm -hmm. um, the results of what it is that they're doing. They feel um, driven in a very sincere and good way. And I got to, in my opinion, one of your critical roles in coordinating that is to make sure that the board feels like they're engaged and that they are making oh, a difference. Yeah. You know? and, and I've seen some executive directors that don't quite embrace that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they're more dictatorial, if you will, rather than collaborative. Yes. I mean, it's... It's understandable. It's really understandable when you think about the makeup of a lot of not-for-profit boards. Uh, um, they tend to be made up, not once again, not invariably, but they tend to be made up quite heavily of people, of professionals, of, uh, of lawyers, of, of um, consultants or um, folks like that. Uh, many of whom have not had to make a payroll. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I've just seen that evidenced again and again and again. And of course, when you're running a not-for-profit, that's something that, uh, yeah, it's not-for-profit, but you've got to pay people. Of and uh, you know, it's running a business like any other business, it would be perhaps with a few more obstacles. Um, well, but believe it uh, or not, we're, we're up on our break time. Oh right my word, now. okay, so that we went, quickly. Yeah, it did. Um, and so we're going to take a short break for about a minute, we'll come back, and, and maybe we could just spend about 60 seconds on the makeup of a board. Sure. And then we'll go into 
the real reason that we're here today is talking about the symphony. <laughs> okay. All right, but this is Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. Uh, we're here with the Hawaii Symphony, and we're, we're talking with the, the CEO over there, uh, Michael Teterton, and we are going to be back in about 60 seconds. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Planning all week for the day of the big game. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. What on the list is who's going to drive. It's nice to know you're going to get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose a DD. Captain of our team. It's the DD. For every game day, assign a designated driver. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I present Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, where we bring together researchers from across the campus to describe a whole series of scientifically interesting topics of interest both to Hawaii and around the world. So hopefully you can join me 1 o'clock Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. Welcome back. This is Reg Baker, Business in Hawaii, and we're here today talking with Michael Teterton about the, Hol the Hawaii Symphony. I almost said hallelujah. Yes, you did. Yeah, we'll we're, get back I to that. Didn't quite get out, <laughs> so the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. Uh, but before we get into that, I just wanted to, to just touch on, uh, Michael, your thoughts about the makeup of a board. Uh, what's your thoughts about board makeup? Oh, uh, well, it's tremendously important. Board recruitment is, uh, is, is a tremendously important exercise, um, often underappreciated. Uh, you need a combination of things. You need folks who uh, share a common vision of what the particular not-for-profit um, should be out to accomplish, what it should aspire to. But the last thing you want is a board that's too homogeneous. Mm. Um, so they need to be with all the same skill sets, well, and the same opinions, and the same social. Uh, you know that, that it, it's important that they be steering the uh, organization into uh, a mutually uh, agreed upon constructive direction. Uh, but uh, you, no, you don't want to, you don't want a board full of lawyers, for example. Uh, now lawyers tend to be uh, quite heavily represented on not-for-profit boards, and not a bad thing at all. Um, but uh, you don't want to overload it that way, nor do you want it overloaded with financial people, because they'll all argue among one another forever about, about you know, the next year's budget. Um, and you, you don't want all of one group. You want different skill sets. And uh, that can be, uh, recruitment is, is a challenge. You don't want somebody, it's not quite fair to say that you don't want somebody who is uh, seeking to be on a board, but you don't want somebody, uh, you don't want it populated with people who want it for the wrong reasons, mm -hmm. in all honesty. Yeah. You don't well, want I refer to that as resume builders. Yes. I mean, I've, I've yes. encountered people that just want to be on the board and do as little as possible. And have the name on the letterhead, yeah. 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 It uh, doesn't really serve anybody. No. Uh, but having folks who are motivated, uh, not motivated to the point of micromanagement, which is a, which is a different mm -hmm. problem. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, different skill sets, fin finance is important, uh, legal uh, understanding is important, political savvy is important, um, expertise in advertising or public relations. Maybe the industry a little bit? Yes, um, that can certainly help. Uh, now, if... Um, I mean, with public radio, which, which I'm familiar, public television, um, Sometimes that mixes well uh, with uh, the disciplines and expertise of commercial radio and, and television, but not always. And uh, uh, you can be setting yourself up for conflict there. They are two completely different industries with different uh, raisons d'etre and uh, um, different ways of supporting themselves, different sets of objectives. Right. So it's just important for whoever it is that's in charge, the president, CEO, to to make sure that not only do they have a current makeup of the board that works well, but they also have a pipeline because 
Yes. Turnover happens, and you got to be ready for that. And yes. You know, and I don't want to dwell on that too long because I, I really want to get into the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. So, um, tell me how you got involved with the orchestra. Um, well, I retired from public radio last year. Um, after I don't know how many years, 40 years or something in that industry, um, and uh, traveled for a little bit and caught up on my reading almost, and uh, <laughs> uh, I was invited to join the board of, of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra, and I was enormously flattered because uh, um, I, through my association with public radio, really, that's where my musical education has been. I mean, I'm a rocker from way back, you know, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, public radio brought me into contact with classical music, and I've developed a, a real appreciation for it. And I have been very enthusiastic about the fact that we have a symphony orchestra, or had a symphony orchestra in this community. Um, I was aware that they had had problems, and in fact, um, you made the observation earlier, inaccurately, I may say, that um, <laughs> if I may be so bold, um, that we uh, that the orchestra uh, went away and came back again. It didn't. It went away and it died, and it is no more. Uh -huh. That's that was the sad end to the Honolulu Symphony Society which uh, was founded in 1902 and existed for over 100 years, oldest orchestra west of the Rockies. Um, wonderful, colorful history and had its real glory days, but, uh, but they, they came to an end. And uh, in 2009, they filed for bankruptcy and they went out of business. When that happened, uh, it was very sad for many, many people. And uh, a small group of citizens uh, in Honolulu, um, a, a very small group, realized that they could not countenance the idea of a Hawaii without a symphony orchestra. And they recognized also that if this situation were to be remedied, it had to happen fairly quickly because it takes a lot of professional musicians to make up a symphony orchestra. And of course, these folks no longer had employment in the orchestra. They had other side gigs, but uh, they began to leave. And uh, if that had been allowed to go on for too long, we'd have gotten below the critical mass necessary to stuff it. Exactly. So there was a certain urgency. And uh, amazingly, this group uh, formed a new 501c3, a not-for-profit company. and. Um, uh, uh, organized the musicians and uh, created this corporate entity that uh, would function once again as a as a nucleus for a symphony orchestra. And in 2012, it put on its first season, which is just amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, that sense of urgency made that happen a little earlier than then perhaps it should have or would have in a mainland community where this business of, of assembling the critical mass of musicians wouldn't be quite such a problem, but here it's critical. It is. And it takes uh, a big commitment to get somebody to move here. Exactly, uh, exactly. And uh, so that was why in 2012 the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra, as it now is, um, came into business, but it came into business a little undercapitalized from where it should be. Mm -hmm making a very difficult job even more difficult. The it's not uncommon for a lot of businesses no, no, no. to start undercapitalized, so, but it's still a challenge. Mm -hmm. But uh, with a lot of businesses, you can start small and grow. With a symphony orchestra, you know, it's, you need those 65 musicians. You can't start it with a triangle and a flute, you know? It's uh, just not going to work. But the response from the community was, was wonderful. A standing ovation went on for, God, Half, I don't know, a long time. It seemed forever uh, when they first came out on stage. It was just, just glorious. Now at that time, I wasn't involved with it. Of course, I was with public radio. But um, I've become, I've attended a lot of concerts since, and I've been aware uh, of what it takes to make this organization happen. And I've become a great deal more aware since I joined the board mm. uh, a few months ago and uh, have recognized that, boy, oh boy, this is a real, a real um, heroic effort that's being made here. They're serious about it. They are serious. If they weren't serious, it wouldn't be happening, and it is happening in a glorious way. But it needs, uh, um, it needs a lot of uh, shoulder to the wheel sort of stuff. And at one point, at some point, um, I was, uh, it, 
invited or suggested that I take over the presidency of the organization, or actually become president because they didn't have, really have one before. And uh, I uh, agreed to do that. And, uh, you know, um, um, I wasn't looking for another career. I'm still not. But uh, I do care about this organization. And uh, so I've been hanging out at the office for the last little while, and now I have my own little cubicle. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm there a lot of the time, and I'm trying to, uh, uh, my, my personal objective is to get this organization onto a business-like footing. Mm. Uh, because of the initial undercapitalization, uh, it's, it's been a bit bumpy uh, for the first five years. We're coming into it, we're, we're in our sixth season now. Um, but we've uh, we've been losing money each year, and that accumulates, and that can't go on forever. So, I've, uh, one of my objectives is to get us debt free, and that was my initial objective with public radio, because um, I think that's very important. And uh, and another objective is to construct a business model that is sustainable, and uh, I think we're well on the road to that. If we, as I've been saying to folks lately when I give little little talks, uh, if we we have a glorious future for this orchestra if we can just get through the present. Yeah, we have two minutes left oh, and I want to get to a couple things yes, real quick. Of course. So um, number one and, and remember I'm I'm a CPA by training and so I, I look for this stuff, but is there an endowment program or something? That there is, is there. There is a foundation. Uh, it's a separate organization, separate uh, uh, separate company, essentially, and it's been in existence for some years and was a foundation that produced an income, or part of the income, for the for our predecessor, uh, and it's um, providing some of that income to this orchestra. It's a little complex because when the earlier orchestra went down, it went down having borrowed from the uh, uh, from that foundation, from the corpus of that, and we're having to put that right before we can get back to uh, uh, getting all of our uh, due fr That's from that. one of the areas mm -hmm. that you know, to be focused on is to build that back up yes. and, and get that you know those balances higher. Now we've got probably less than a minute before we have to break, um, and I just wanted to. Yeah, th there's a lot of programs. There's a lot of events that are coming up, and, mm -hmm. and you've got uh, a couple coming up here soon for the holidays. Oh heavens, yes. Well, we have our Masterwork series, which is our classical music series, and uh, we have some of the world's best artists coming in to work with the orchestra. Uh, Leonard Slatkin, the uh, um, very v f first rank uh, American conductor, is 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 coming in to work with us. Long Long is is coming in, uh, uh, arguably the greatest pianist alive right now. Uh, so that's the classical series. We have the Pops series, which uh, we have a holiday Pops coming up in December. We have uh, uh, this weekend, we're, we're doing a, a, a two concerts of music by Michael Jackson, wow. along with dancers and singers and the whole nine yards. Wow. And uh, that's typical of, of, a, of the way we're trying to spread our wings a little to a wider demographic. And real quickly, mm -hmm. Where can somebody go to find out more information on this and maybe purchase some tickets and, and attend? That's the most important piece of information in this program. It, it'll be uh, at the website uh, hawaiisymphonyorchestra.org. Right. Which is on the screen right now. Oh yes, there it is. Look at that. Yeah. Um, and uh, you go there, you'll find the whole schedule, and it's still in a state of becoming for this for this season. Um, and, uh, and so it'll have all the information about the different programs yes. and when they're going to be airing and how to get the tickets yes. and, and all of that. That's and we have a little office in Kaimuki, and you're welcome to come by and chat about the orchestra, or uh, even better, buy tickets or buy a subscription for the series. Good. Well, maybe early next year we can have you back on the show again. You can give us another update on what's going on over there and how well things are going and what the other programs are that you got. I love it and thank right. you very much for having well, me. Michael, it was a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very My much. Uh, this is Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. Uh, we air every Thursday from 2 to 2.30 and I sure hope to see you next week. Until then, aloha.